Hello YouTube. In this advanced tutorial series, I'm going to be attempting a complex dance animation project. I will be stitching together a performance from several professional dancers to create a 3D animated dance production. To be clear, all the dancing you are seeing on the left side of the screen is going to be animated onto one character. In addition to having the challenging task of stitching several references together into one animation, I'm going to be making some modifications to enhance the entertainment value of the finished result. First, I'm going to be passing the baton back and forth between two energetic drone mounted cameras. One of them will be more energetic than the other and will be responsible for catching dynamic angles of the performance. This means a lot of the staging choices in the reference footage shown is going to be altered significantly. Cameras will be zipping back and forth and revolving around the character to give the production a pop or dance music video feel. Some of these camera movements will be motivated by the dancer's moves and others will be premeditated movements by the drone to get the camera into position for certain moves. Second, I will be exaggerating the action in key areas with a fairly wacky animation style. Third, I will be fusing in a lot of dynamic simulations into the performance by way of MASH and Bifrost in Maya. Fourth, a cane is going to be incorporated into the final section of the performance. This means the performer's actions will have to be altered to accommodate the prop. Fifth, the character will transition between different outfits to match the outfit of the performers in the reference. These transitions will happen with various special effects or dynamic simulations. And lastly, the entire performance will be witnessed by a crowd of humanoid robots to give the shot a breakdance competition feel. The crowd will be fairly idle. They will act like dance students watching their dance instructor perform a masterpiece that is akin in skill level to other performances they have witnessed from her. In other words, they will not be surprised by the performance, but instead stare in awe, nod in approval, and whisper to each other, and in some instances, try to mimic the dancer's moves in certain shots. I want to make sure to mention that this course is not going to teach any animation fundamentals or animation body dynamics. The focus here is more on creating a finished production result with a lot of dynamic simulations and also on experimenting with a not so common workflow for planning an animated project. I will however be discussing all the challenges I encounter while trying to animate this sequence and how I resolve them. If you want to learn more about animation fundamentals and body dynamics, check out Animation Mentor, Anim School, or iAnimate's YouTube pages. I attended Animation Mentor from 2013 to 2014 to study their character animation course. It was a very fun experience. This project will have a lot of moving parts that will require quite a few software packages and tools to accomplish. I will be sharing most parts of the below stages in detail with step-by-step -step instructional videos. For more challenging parts like the 3D character animation, I will be discussing my personal viewpoints and tricks for getting stuff done. To complete this project, I will be relying on Maya, ZBrush, Substance Painter, Adobe Animate, Adobe After Effects, Adobe Premiere, and maybe Adobe Photoshop. I'm going to be sharing the exact time and hours it takes to complete each stage of production with every upload. Before I start a detailed breakdown of the animated sequence, I'm going to share some important technical details. I will be using my Kiwa Boogie rig for this project. She has a tail and very big ears. So I will be inventing animation for the tail and ears and incorporating the result into the final performance. I mentioned before that I will be cycling through outfits for the entire performance. The first few hip hop style performances will be using this outfit she has on with some minor changes. The rest of the performances 
will utilize the same outfits that the dancers have on or a mix of outfits that match very closely to what the dancer has on. Another important clothing article that is going to keep the viewer focused in on Kiwa's dance moves and not her facial expressions is a wool ski mask or balaclava. The lettering on the ski mask or balaclava may be tagged with whichever dancer is currently performing. This is a video of a Red Bull breakdance competition in Mumbai. I love everything about this stage, so I'm going to recreate it for this performance. The logo in the center will change, but the scuff marks on the floor I will keep. One thing I also like about this set is the fact that the sides have what appears to be hanging banners. They will act as a screen mark that will help keep the viewer oriented correctly. A better explanation of this point is that because of the amount of dynamic camera animation this shot is going to have, I don't want the entire background to be shrouded in darkness. This will cause the viewer to be disoriented. I will also be going for the same lighting setup that the set has. There are a lot of stage lights mounted on a light truss above that are primary illuminators of the scene. The lighting color, intensity, and rotation will be animated heavily for this production. I did some research to see if I could find some reference for the light truss and the stage lights mounted on it. And I came across some Turbo Squid products that show exactly what I'm seeing in the reference video. This one appears to be the best option. So I'm going to purchase it and rig it for this project. As I mentioned previously, I will be creating my own idle animations on robot rigs these are the robot rigs I will be using for this project. From left to right, I have the Jogan 754 robot by Ben Tiefholtz on TurboSquid. B4Y4 BOZ robot that ships with Autodesk Maya. Battle Droid Yoku by Blender Zone on CG Trader. Red Robot by Ritty Kraj on TurboSquid.com. And lastly, the Jessica rig by Thomas Wiegand on animprops.com. I will also be supplementing my own idle animations with idle animations from Adobe Mixamo's mannequin or robot rig. I'll be reducing the detail and value contrast of the robot spectators in order to ensure that they do not distract from the main performance. This production is going to have a playtime of approximately 1 minute and 15 seconds and it will be animated at a frame rate of 30 frames per second. This means I will be shooting for a total of about 2,250 animation frames. For this project, in order to get the highest quality render result, I will be using a render farm service. This is my first time using a render farm so I'll be happy to share the process, experience, and cost with you all. I want to use Rebus Farm. They have a shelf tool that allows you to inspect your scene for their servers. I like that. That is what made me choose them. Using a render farm will allow me to render my VFX at the optimal quality. It will also allow me to go for two to 4K resolutions for my final render. And most importantly, it will free up my machine to author other tutorials that I'm working on. Starting with the performer, Ave Moves, I'm going to start with a fairly dim illumination on the scene because their moves are really uh, sleek, like really more slower. And so I'm going to start with a fairly dim scene and slowly ramp up. It's going to be dimmer than this reference footage here. And Ave Moves is going to do his thing. So he's going to slide. And what I'm going to have is traces of dynamic simulations or these elemental uh, generations or wispy smoke at the focal points. Now the focal points are where the force appears to be. So wherever he seems to be, he's charting this force through his body. So the elemental generations will highlight those focal points. And a very important thing about the transition between Ave moves and the next artist, which is Kid of the Great, is that I'm going to have the attire change color. 
right? And potentially also the uh, skin of the ca character will change color to denote that we're now going to a different performer. And he will have the same thing with the elemental generations at the places where the force appears to be. In his case, some of it will also be around his legs. And so we come from Kida. And by this time, the dim light scene is slowly ramping up, very slowly, not too much. And then when he does this kick, I'm gonna do a bulge distortion or some type of a time warp to jump us into the next performance from Teppo. And his performance is a lot more upbeat than these really slow sliding performances. So we're gonna go from this slow performance and we're gonna get like this type of a time warp into this more upbeat performance by Teppo. So by the time we get to Teppo, we're going to do something really interesting with the lighting. Every time his heels hit the ground, I'm going to ramp up the lighting. So the first time his heels hit the ground, I'll ramp up the lighting now a lot more aggressively to about 30% of what you're seeing up here. And his heels hit the ground again, and I'll ramp up to 70%. And then his heels hit the ground again, and then we're at 100%. So now we'll have the full lighting that this reference has. And the lighting I'm talking about here are the light truss and the stage lights up there. So you're gonna see them also possibly animating aggressively, but I'm not sure about that yet. I don't, I don't want this to be too distracting from the performance. Now, with Teppo, it was a long performance, so I cut a portion of it. So for this part where there's going to be a disconnected transition, I'm going to put a really toony style hop here to, to, to make this transition more seamless and more entertaining. And then we move through Teppo's performance. And another important thing about his performance is, the minute he does this, this is where the dynamic camera animation is going to start aggressively. So when he makes this move, the camera is going to shoot up to the top right perspective and be viewing him from the top down. This is going to be one of the more complicated parts because he's already done this thing with the camera where the camera is reacting to his movements, I think his chest, and I'm going to try to echo that movement. So over here, when he moves like this, he, the camera moves with him, but I have put it on the top right. So I'm going to try to shift it so that it's, it's viewing him more from the front in the same way he has shifted it, except his is just happening in one plane. But since our camera is up there, I'm going to sort of shift and rotate so we're looking at him more. Then it happens again here, not as intense, but then our camera is also then going to move from the front to a more perspective left view of him from a lower angle. And then for this last part where his movements are controlling what the camera is doing, I'm going to take our dynamic camera and bring it down so we're looking at him from a lower angle. And that is in preparation for this move that he does with his feet. I wanna shoot it from a very low angle. So yeah, his is going to be fairly complicated. I'm going to be sketching this whole thing I'm going to be doing this interesting pre-visualization process. So you'll get to see the plan a lot more clearly before I start animating this stuff. So for Teppo's transition to the next dancer, when Teppo does this move, this sliding move here, he's going to explode into a cloud of very thick smoke. And that thick smoke is going to come towards the screen to denote the end of his performance. Now the best example of what I'm going for is Nightcrawler from the X-Men movies. All right, so I have this little snippet of Nightcrawler doing the explosion. All right. So his is just a little lighter. I want mine to be very thick. And the additional thing I'm going to be doing with mine is when Teppo explodes into it, it's going to have a brighter energy force inside of it, a more vibrant color. And this is going to usher us into the next performance by Garen. Right, the character is going to appear with that same effect, a big, thick smoke with a brighter, more vibrant energy force within it. So it should explode into frame. And then it will trail this movement she's doing. She's doing this very snake-like movement. So the smoke will trail her. She's going to be reacting with the smoke. So I'll be using 
Bifrost arrow in Maya to generate the smoke and the characters are going to be collision objects. So the characters can be whipping through the smoke as the smoke tries to dissipate. So Girin goes through her entire performance and her entire performance is going to be characterized by the smoke. Every time she performs these gestures, I'm going to have her pop into the black smoke a little. For some parts like, let me get to right here. At this very important part, she does, as soon as she extends her hands outward like this, she's going to do the next teleportation that we used to introduce her into the scene from Tepo. Right, so she explodes into that thick black smoke with the brighter energy field in it and ends up screen left and closer to the screen. So she's going to pop from back there and come to the front of the screen. And I have a little snippet of Nightcrawler in the bottom right so you can get a better visualization. So she pops forward. So this entire performance is now continuing on from here. And then she does another move here, right there, where she pops her chest out and I'm going to make the smoke pop out of her chest. Right, so her chest will be like an emitter and it will pop some smoke into the air. Right, it's a very interesting gesture and I want to denote it with a lot of smoke. Right. And then when Girin is closer to the end of her performance, she does this thing where she throws her hands into the air. Her hands being thrown into the air will motivate a camera move. And so now we're going to be looking at her from the top and it's time to transition from Girin to the next dancer. So the smoke will be dissipating above towards the camera. We're looking at her from top down. And the next VFX for the next performance is going to start. It's going to be these cubes moving towards her with a radial force. And it's for the next performer, it's for Latrice. But before we get to Latrice, we're going to use Sule Kami. He does this really cool spin, right? And we're going to use him, this really cool spin he has going on here, to transition out of Girin's performance. So as he's going around, I'll do a time freeze in the middle of his spin, right? We'll go for a more medium shot of the character. And as he's spinning, those cubes that were emanating in a radial fashion towards Girin, when we were looking at her from the top, they're going to be trying to keep up with the spin in a whirlwind fashion up to about the knee area. And then we'll go in for a close up and the character is still in Girin's attire. I forgot to mention that when Girin comes into frame, the character will have on exactly what Girin has on. All right, so we're gonna to transition to this attire. And so at this particular point where we're going to explode out of Girin's attire and explode into Latrice's attire, this looks very complicated, but you, it'll all come together when you see the pencil test. So we explode out of Girin's attire, and then those same cubes that Girin's attire explodes into, reform to create Latrice's attire. Sule's spin, when you see Sule, when he finishes his spin, he lands on one foot. But instead of landing on one foot, we we'll land in, in exactly the way Latrice has landed. The, the character should have clothing attire similar to what you're seeing here a skirt sort of like a plaid skirt with this ruffling underneath it and again that would be formed over here from the explosion out of Girin's attire into what Latrice is wearing. So Latrice's entire performance will be characterized by these cubes that ushered in her scene that allowed us to exit Girin's performance and come into Latrice's performance. So it's going to be a whole bunch of cubes. The whole stage is going to be a whole bunch of bouncing cubes bouncing at this very low frequency but every time her foot makes contact with the ground, the cubes are going to react aggressively, right? So they're gonna pop out. So I think this would be really fun to do. And another thing about this performance is that the camera is going to go around her in the way I've described here. So for her entire performance, it's going to start at this viewing angle, this sort of low perspective, and then it's gonna go around her, all the way around, and by the time it gets to the end of her performance, it should be at the bottom here, closer to her foot. And this is where I'm gonna use this really cool stylized kick from Natalie to get us out of Latrice's performance because the camera should be about around this angle. Natalie Bebko is this dancer. 
and she's going to kick the camera and we're going to fade to black right, for the final performance. So the final performance is a combination of sensual performances by two uh, very cool dancers. One of them is called Geneva Petway and then the other one is Amadi. We're going to, like I said, go to a black screen so we won't be able to see anything or we might be looking at a very slight silhouette of the character and this is what you're going to be looking at. The character is now, the fit is changed into one that is a hybrid of Geneva and Amadi's outfit. So these two outfits, I'm going to combine them to create one outfit. The character is going to be in heels. And so the stage lights are then going to pop on because like I said, we're, we're in the dark and we'll be able to see the character fully. And this is the cane I was talking about that's going to be incorporated into the last part of the footage. And then Geneva will start her performance. Now this performance is going to have a lot of fluid simulations. And the reason I have this snippet from Rihanna's music video here, this is Rihanna's umbrella music video, and all this water effects that you see, I'm going to do something similar. Everything the dancer does is either going to generate water or the water is going to act as a controlling force. And at the same time, I'm going to have the cane in here. I have to incorporate the cane into everything Geneva is doing. And at this part where Mario does this thing for, with, with Geneva, I'm going to make the water form into a human-like form and actually perform this, whatever hand gesture she's doing. So it's going to be a water body doing that. And then we're going to transition from there into Geneva. All this time we still have the cane, so I have to figure out how to incorporate the cane in here. Right. And then for Geneva's performance, it's going to be very cane heavy. So I've done a few thumbnails of what I want the cane to be doing. She's going to toss it up a few times so that I can allow her performance to be fairly close to what she's doing. So sometimes she's going to toss the cane into the air at least twice. Right. It's going to go into the air. She's going to catch it and keep twirling and twirling and twirling. And I might or might not have a lot of water effects here. Actually, there is going to be a fair amount of it because I want to match uh, the water effects from Geneva's performance. And then the entire performance comes to a close with this move from Amadi. So Amadi spins like this and she does this lean. I should make sure you can see the lean. Yeah, there's a lean by Amadi. I don't know why it disappeared from the main footage but it's a lean like this. And when she performs that lean, as she performs it, she's going to burst into a big puddle of water to close out the scene. All right, so she bursts into a big puddle of water, the cane drops, and then from here on, I'm going to go for a close up of the water settling and the cane bouncing, and this is the end of the performance. It's very complicated and it sounds pretty messy now, but in the next, three lessons or so, you're going to have a very clear vision of what I'm doing by the way of a layout and pencil test pre-visualization video. So we're here in Maya 2024 and the first thing I'm going to do is create a camera rig that I can reuse. This camera rig is going to help simplify the camera animation. So I'm going to start by hiding her model, no control H, I'm going to create cameras, create a regular camera. First thing I'm going to do is size it up just slightly. Let me bring her back to make sure it's a good size. I want to be able to identify it very easily so it needs to get a little bit bigger. I'm going to make it about that, about the size of a real camera. It doesn't really matter but for me I want to be able to see it in the scene while I'm looking at her full shot. So I'm gonna go back into hiding her. The first thing I'm going to do is group, create a group. So control G. And this is going to be our master GRP. I'm gonna call it a master group. It's at the right place, it's at world. Then I'm gonna to proceed to group this thing a few more times. So control G, control G. I want six subgroups. Control G, Control G, 
Control G and one more, Control G. And I'm going to name them, starting from the top, trans X. So that's gonna represent the transform X. It's gonna be trans Z. It's gonna be, actually, you know, this is gonna be trans Y. That's the correct order. This one's gonna be trans Z. This one's gonna be rote X for rotation X. Rote Y and rote Z. Okay. So these groups are going to help me isolate these transforms in a way that reduces the amount of confusion when I'm in the middle of my scene and the camera is oriented in a very crazy way or when the camera is oriented in a very dynamic way, at least I know where I put my transforms, exactly where I put my transforms and it becomes a lot more easier to manage and to sort of layer in camera animation. So since this one is going to be responsible for translation X, I'm going to lock and hide all the other parameters I don't need. So I'm gonna come over here and go lock and hide selected. This one is for trans Y. I'm going to do the same here. Lock and hide selected. This one's for trans Z, so I'm going to select all the other transforms. Lock and hide selected. Go to rotation X. Lock and hide selected. Rotate Y. Lock and hide selected. And the last one is rotate Z. Lock and I select this. So now if I select this and I dial this, I know I'm it's what it's responsible for. I can select translate Y, hold down control, middle click to control the Y of the camera. So, and I'll be able to do the same with all these. If I come over here, this gives me rotate Y. Now I have all the transforms that I need. But these controls are what I would classify as sweetener controls. So they're there to nudge and adjust the camera. But the main camera controller is what I'm going to create now. So I'm going to do that by first creating a locator. I'm going to increase the locator size so I can see it. I'm going to call it Cam Locator Master. Okay. And I'm going to take the locator, move it out to about there. And then I'll grab my entire camera master group and dump it underneath the locator. Okay. So what this locator is going to do, is going to allow me to do more freeform rotations of the camera where I don't want to use individual transforms. This is just going to allow me to position and rotate a lot more freely. Right, and that's going to be the main camera controller. What I'm going to do to help me always know the orientation of this camera is to create a fairly detailed control to let me know how I'm oriented every time. So I'm going to start creating the control by first creating a cube. So I'll create a cube, scale it up, come next down. Take the face, this face of the cube and scale it down a bit. And then I'm going to grab the vertices and go actually it's somewhere there, merge. I'm going to go apply and it looks like it's not close enough. I'm going to go a little bit closer and apply and there, so it's merged. Okay, so now this is going to be a good orienter, but I don't want the cube. I want to draw a control system on top of it, so I'm going to go create. I'm going to activate my curve tools, my EP curve tool, and I want one degree. I'm going to start snapping a curve onto this and make sure I snap it enough times to make sure I've covered every single edge. I'm going to hit enter. I should now have a control. So if I hide the cube, I have a control system. Now the next thing I'm going to do to help me further know the orientation of this thing is to give it some labeling. 
So I'm going to go to the text tool, go create type. And on this type, I'm going to start with the label top. And this type should be somewhere here. All right. And I want a curve system from it. I don't really want thickness, but I think I should be able to hit create. And yes, it creates a nice curve system. So I have all these. So I can move it out the way. So that's top. I'm going to do the same thing to get a bottom labeling. So I'm going to go bottom. And I'm going to create curves from type. So I have my second set of curves. I can move it. like this these T's are a little too close to each other so I'm gonna select them like that and move them I don't want to confuse myself or not be able to read it it needs to be legible so next side I'm going to identify is screen left so I'll just uh, denote that with an SL I think that should be enough create So out the way, and then we have one more. I want screen right. So I'm going to go SR and create. Okay, so now I have all the four sides of my camera labeling. I can hide my type. I don't need it anymore. So once the type is hidden, it's time to move these labels to the appropriate part of the camera. I'm gonna go into the side view here to the right and make sure that it's flush with this bottom side with the back of the arrow. Okay, so then, all right, so when I'm looking at it from this angle, I should be able to see top like this. Let me scale that down. This will always let me know that this is the top of the camera. So I'm gonna do the same with the bottom move it go into the right view move it till it's flush with the back of the arrow perspective move it into position scale it down this always let me know it's the bottom for the sake of it's not a big deal i think it's it'll be fine even if it's this small Actually, no, I'm going to try to keep them about the same size. It looks fairly sloppy. So I'm going to center pivot and come over here and center pivot and try to scale this thing down so it's about the same size. Right. Well, if you just look at the scaling I used for that, that's 0 0.361. So I'll do the same thing here 0 0.361. I'm going to do the same with these two. I'm going to make them 0.361. And then I'm going to move them into position. So this is screen left. So that's going to, yet again, be moved until it's flush. I'm going to do the same with the other one. So we don't have to come back into the side view. For screen right. I should be able to match the height in the Y, so that's minus 3.507. So that's minus 3.507. Okay, all right, this is the controller I'm going to be using, but I have to combine all of these shapes into one because I need to, whenever I select any one of them, it needs to select all of them at the same time. It's a control, it's not supposed to be, have individual pieces. So to do that, let me try this. I haven't tried this in a while, but it should work. Let me make sure everybody's oriented correctly. Okay, and I think that these two could move it slightly up. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is freeze transforms on all of these for now. That's something I should do before I attempt what I'm going to do. So I'm gonna freeze transforms. And the next thing I'm going to do is unravel all the groups and select every single curve 
for the lettering I just created. Then I'm going to hit the down key and this should access all their shape nodes so that now when I control click on my main arrow I can go into the mail command window and go parent parent dash r dash s sorry it's parent I left out an r Okay, I seem to have made a mistake. Looks like the f I didn't freeze transforms on the curves, which is what I should have done. Well, I should have free frozen transforms with them in world. They are under a group, so I shouldn't have done that. It just pushed their transforms to the group. So I'm gonna go Shift P to get all of them out of there. Freeze transforms yet again. And then now with all of them selected, I'm gonna hit the down key to access their shape nodes. Then click on this main arrow. Then come back to the mail command window, hit up to load in the last uh, command I wrote in, and hit enter. And now, I should be fine. I have a single controller, it doesn't matter what I select, I've selected the main camera controller. Okay. So then the next thing to do is to select the controller, I'm going to center its pivot. And I'm going to select it, select the locator, and go modify, match transforms, and do match uh, translation and rotation actually no I just need to match translation I'm going to apply okay so it's right there and this should be fine locationing but I think I could uh, move things around a little better so it doesn't look so confusing so I'm going to go into the component mode select all the vertices and move this so it's just a little bit ahead so I can just also see the locator okay so that's it uh, all I have to do now is parent I'm gonna label this as camera master CTRL for camera master controller and I'm going to grab this locator group this feels a little redundant but like I said this is for the labeling we need the labeling and this locator might prove to be useful if we ever need to do an offset. So now I'm gonna take the locator, which has the entire camera housed under it, that camera and all its subgroups. I'm gonna take that locator and I'm going to parent it underneath our new control system. Actually, hold on a second, I made a mistake. What I have to do now is once I have this, this control here, I wanna freeze this transforms, I don't need to have translation values so i'm going to freeze transforms and then now i'm going to dump this locator underneath it okay so now i have zero transforms and i have a camera controller that i can use to rotate the camera whichever way i want and then i can sweeten the any transform i like by just maybe coming over here and then using translate y to adjust you translate Y to adjust and I can do that with any one of these parameters so it just helps me to isolate the transforms and still have a master controller so I'm going to take this control and I'm going to zero it out of the rotation so I can get it to zero and the next thing I'm going to do is hide the locator's shape because I don't need to see it anymore so I'm going to hit the down key to access its shape mode and object display and I can turn off visibility I just know it's there and then I'm going to lock and hide the scale because I don't need the scale I just need it for translation and rotation okay. I'm gonna come over here I have some zeroing scripts so I'm gonna zero rotation zero translation with it so that's the camera rig let me see let me test it out with the character so I'm gonna go shift H show the character and then I'm going to come to the side, and go to panels, I'm sorry, and then go to perspective. I should be able to access camera one here. And from this view, I can check to see how camera one is going to function. So I can move it. I can do dynamic camera moves. And it looks like it's working. Okay. okay. So this is the resource, and whenever I need a new camera, all I have to do is select 
this group and duplicate it. So by duplicating it, it just allows me to come have a new camera rig. I would then have to go underneath it and rename a lot of these nodes so that I can get a unique camera name. I don't want any clashes later on when I'm selecting cameras. So anyway, that is our camera rig. I was going to create the proxy scene and the proxy rig in this video, but this introductory lesson has gotten too long. I'm at 40 minutes, so I'm going to postpone that work for the next lesson. In the next lesson, I'm going to create the proxy scene and the proxy rig. Then next, I'll start blocking some poses to help me create my camera animation and then push everything to Adobe Animate to start working on the pencil test. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you like this video.